Latinos are now the largest minority group in the United States. That change has been a long time coming though demographic growth has not translated into political, social, economic, or religious power of the same proportions. Part of the reason is that the term Latino includes a multitude of people that have little in common, people whose historical background is from over 20 countries, including the United States, people whose ancestors were in the Southwest before Jamestown was established, and the, the person who crossed the border today are all called Latinos. Because of the strange relationship between the U.S. and Latin America, a person born in the U.S., in the US a U.S. citizen on uh, the territory of the U.S., Puerto Rico, becomes an immigrant when they move to the United States. Nonetheless, Latinos continue to grow faster than the U.S. population at large because we have higher growth rates and uh, than other uh, groups in the United States. And the unique relationship between the U.S. and Latin America means that there will likely be some level of uh, continued migration from south to north in the foreseeable future. Latinos are more religious and more Christian than the U.S. population at large. About 20% of the Latino population is Protestant, though there are countries in Latin America that have a higher percentage of Protestants. Latino Protestants have a very diverse history, often being doubly marginalized. Historically, Latino Catholics have marginalized them because they're Protestant, and U.S. Protestants have marginalized them because they're Latino. This means that Latino Protestants have often lived in an in-between space, ethnically, religiously, and socially. We want to explore this space through a missiological reflection on the history and development of Latino Protestantism. An in-between space uh, with the United States. Juan Gonzalez argues in his book, Harvest of Empire, that there is a direct relationship between U.S. intervention in Latin America and subsequent migration north. The U.S. seizure of the Southwest from Mexico made in 1848, made 100,000 Mexicans U.S. citizens, no second class, and created the patterns of Mexican migration that continue to this day. The war with uh, Spain made Puerto Ricans a colony and made Puerto Ricans U.S. citizens, though with no direct political re representation in Washington, D.C., and able to freely move to the U.S. mainland. This same uh, war created a strange relationship with Cuba, which would l later create its own migratory patterns. U.S. interventions in the Dominican Republic and in Central America created other migratory patterns. So Latinos find themselves constantly in a place between presence and migration. The uh, Mexicans who were in the Southwest when the United States took over the, this land uh, became foreigners in their own land because they were the new immigrants from the East were now the citizens. So even though they were the majority of Latinos have been born in the United States, we are eternally foreigners. And the relationship between the United States and Latin America continues to be a complicated one in which one can anticipate more U.S. intervention, which will create new migratory patterns. The late 19th century Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz stated that Mexico's biggest problem was that it was so far from God and so close to the United States. Nonetheless, we are linked and because of this in-between relationship, it's likely to continue. An in-between identity. Latino identity as it now exists, beginning the violent encounter between the European conquerors, the indigenous peoples, and the for, later forced migration of people from Africa. There would also be migration for, uh, from other parts of, uh, of the world to Latin America, but it was this violent encounters that produced the mestizo identity that d defined what it means to uh, be a Latin American or a United States Latino today. That uh, original mestizaje experienced a second type of mestizaje when the, the U.S. takeover of the Southwest and Puerto Rican. Because uh, this encounter, also violent at the beginning, created new types of relationships. The white majority had a very inconsistent way of dealing with the Latino minority. On the one hand, the lighter skinned landowners became honorary whites, but the poor and darker skinned relatives of, of these people were treated as Mexicans. 
a few mostly rich Latin, uh, Latinos married into the majority, but most re remained separate. They had to learn how to fit in the society of the conqueror, even though they uh, redefined their identity in, new, in this new reality. In practice, most Latinos developed a type of a, a polycentric identity, learning to fit in more than one cultural space, moving between the vi various cultural, ethnic, and, so and social poles that define their lives. A colorism that is still part of our culture, our language, and our identity is part of all of this. For example, a person that is light-skinned is considered more beautiful. This situation became more complex as Latino migration diversified. Today, one of the most significant challenges is the fact that many Latinos live in places where the growing populations are other minorities or immigrant communities. Another challenge is that there are a, a growing number of, of places where Latinos are the majority and newcomers need to understand how to adapt to their presence and cultural influence. Many younger uh, generation uh, Latinos face this in-betweenness as the experience of being polycentric in a multi-centric world. An in-between Christian faith. Christianity arrived in Latin America with the, Port the Spanish and Portuguese Catholic missionaries. This faith was, was imposed mostly by military force, which created an outward conversion but a, an underground continuation of the many of the traditional indigenous and African religious practices. In, in practice, the result was a official Catholicism and a popular Catholicism that reflected a synchronistic combination of Catholicism and previous faith. This was the faith practiced by the Mexican faithful in the time of the U.S. takeover of the Southwest. Both the American Protestant and Catholics challenged these religious practices. The Protestants only saw paganism, while the American Catholics saw a simplistic, childlike faith with little uh, theological framing. Both worked very hard to change the Mexican Catholics. American Catholics <clears throat> removed most of the existing Mexican priests and worked very hard to Americanize the, uh, the Mexicans. Protestant missionaries also evangelize and Americanize. U.S. Protestant missionaries were convinced that Americans were the new Israelites that had been given a new Canaan. Of course, in that interpretation, the Mexicans were Kenyanites who no longer had a right to the land and who would soon disappear. Nonetheless, many missionaries felt that the Mexicans should be evangelized before they completely disappeared as a, as a people. By the uh, beginning of the 20th century, three to 5% of the Mexican population of the Southwest was Protestant. And it seemed like the Mexicans who wanted to fit in the new reality of the American Southwest thought it might be uh, uh, helpful to become Protestant. But uh, Latino Protestants were already becoming a doubly marginalized community. U.S. Protestants wanted them to convert, but did not feel comfortable with them in their churches. And several Latino communities in the Southwest literally split into Catholic and Protestant sections. But several important things happened in the first part of the 20th century that redefined Latino Protestantism. On the one hand, by the 1930s, most of the Protestant denominations had ministries among the Latinos, with evangelical groups growing faster than the historical denominations. But the most significant event was the birth of the modern Pentecostal movement at Azusa Street, beginning in 1906. There were many Mexicans converts at Azusa Street, and they took the Pentecostal message back to Latin America and to the Latino USA. There was a slow but steady growth amongst Latino Protestantism through the middle of the 20th century, with the Pentecostals slowly becoming the largest group of Latino Protestants. The next major move occurred after 1965, when the U.S. changed its immigration policy and began to allow more people from Latin America to move into this country. While this change was happening in the U.S., Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement were changing the face of Christianity in Latin America. So when the new immigrants came, many of them were already Protestant. They came from dynamic churches, and many brought their own pastors and churches. 
something that had not happened with the earlier migrations. Because the percentage of Protestants in Puerto Rico, Guatemala, and El Salvador was higher than the percentage of Latino Protestants, the Latino Protestant population continued to grow as a percentage of the population. Tied to this continue, continuing an easy relationship between American and Latino Catholics, Latino Catholics in the United States continued to be convert to Protestantism, particularly Pentecostalism. The traditional interpretation among sociologists and many Catholics was that the Latino conversions to Protestantism were part of the assimilation process into the United States society. But numerous studies have demonstrated that, at least amongst Latino Pentecostals, they have a higher identity maintenance than Latino Catholics. Nonetheless, the issue of structural assimilation affects uh, Latino Protestants. For, uh, to, uh, in, in today's world, there are Protest, uh, Protestantes and Latino Protestantism, the former being people where their ethnic and religious identity are closely linked and the, the later being people whose Christian commitment is fairly separate from their ethnic identity. Currently, Latino Protestantism clearly reflects various in betweenness For example, Latino Protestant churches are growing, but many Latino Protestants do not uh, attend uh, predominant Latino churches. Mainline churches claim to believe in diversity and openness toward Latinos, but Latinos are much more interested in Pentecostal and evangelical churches. Though two-thirds of Latinos have a Mexican background, Latino Protestants are much likely to be of Puerto Rican or Central American descent, since Mexico is the most Catholic country in the world. This tendency is so strong that most of the nationally recognized Latino Protestants, uh, Protestant leaders are Puerto Rican. So Latino Protestants continue to grow in the space between migration and structural assimilation. They also inhabit a predominantly Pentecostal world that makes uh, them very different from the majority of U.S. Protestants. This in-betweenness would seem to be to indicate that Latino Protestants will follow several trajectories as they look toward the future. Migration and closeness, closeness to Latin America will continue to be part of the equation, even as Latino Protestants negotiate being a part of the life in the United States. Living in an in-between life in the United States. Latinos continue to live in an in-between space in the United States. Politically, most of them identify with Democrats when looking at the social problems of the United States. Though the Obama administration has deported more undocumented Latinos than any president in the history of this country. Most Latinos are against abortion and are for heterosexual marriage. So it would seem like they would be Republicans. Though the Republicans are not sure that they want them in the party. The Donald Trump administration called for a fence across the Mexican border to keep the Latinos out, as if they were a problem for the United States. His administration dramatically changed the U.S. immigration system through 400 executive orders and re regulatory changes instituted with outgoing through Congress. These changes have unilaterally restricted humanitarian benefits such as refugee or asylum status increased enforcement and decreased uh, legal immigration. He has been stopped by the courts temporarily uh, from eliminating the DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood of Arrivals, the uh, Obama era, uh, era program for protecting the individuals brought to the United States as minors who meet certain requirements. With new immigrants, uh, Latino immigrants, continue to redefine and reframe the story of the Latinos in the United States. Most of the time, they do not know the past of the U.S. Latinos, and they bring their Latin America mix into the, uh, into the history. At the same time, Latinos are structurally assimilating and are disconnecting from the story. So Latino identity I, continues to exist in the bookends between migration and structural assimilation. Mañana a way of being a Latino believer in an in-between place. The term mañana means more than tomorrow in common Spanish idiom. 
In practice, it only means not today. In some circles, it can become a form of escapism, a focus on a mañana, uh, tomorrow that will never come. But mañana is also a powerful eschatological term. To believe in mañana is to believe in God's future. The present may seem hopeless at times, but mañana is in God's hands. Mañana invites us to live the reality of in-betweenness in hope, believing that God will bring justice and peace through, the, uh, through Jesus Christ. Because we believe in mañana, we can believe in a future where our polycentric identities will not merely uh, be tools for survival, but will be recognized as gifts to more effectively serve the missiological God who calls us to live in the in-betweenness of already and not yet. That's us.